Today is day five in our preparation for the most precious blood. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who camest down from heaven to earth, from the bosom of the Father, and didst shed thy precious blood for the remission of our sins, we humbly beseech thee that in the day of judgment we may deserve to hear standing at thy right hand, come ye blessed, who livest and reignest for ever and ever. Amen. Yesterday we went over the first nocturne of the Office of Matins, and today I want to take you through the second nocturne. So you may recall that there are three nocturnes in the Office of Matins, on, at least on these big feasts. And what do those nocturnes mean? Well, we have the hours of the day, and we have the nocturnes, or the night watches of the night. So in, in the Gospels, we... Uh, we hear that this way of measuring time is used. So we have during the hour that, um, or during the day that our Lord was condemned at the third hour, he was crucified at the sixth hour, he died at the ninth hour. We also um, hear our Lord speak the parable about the, um, the workers who come to work at the first hour of the day, the third, the sixth, the ninth hour, and those who come to work at the eleventh hour. Now, we might think of 11, the 11th hour as being the hour before midnight, when in actuality, the 11th hour is about 5 p.m., the 12th hour being at 6 p.m. And at 6 p.m., that's generally when we pray Vespers, evening prayer, and then we have the watches of the night. So, as, um, let's see here. So, uh, the hours of the night generally would go from 9 to midnight, midnight to 3 a.m., 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., and then the fourth watch of the night begins at dawn when we pray lauds. So that time between 6 p.m. when we pray vespers or evening prayer and 9 p.m., three hours later, is when we pray compline, or it must be prayed before you go to bed at midnight, or before, before you go to bed, or before midnight, and that ends the day, and then we have you know, the watches of the night from nine to midnight, etc. So those correspond uh, in the gospel. Our Lord speaks about the watches of the night and the return of the bridegroom and that the, uh, the master of the house must be ready because if the Lord comes at the second watch or the third watch, uh, blessed is that servant who is watching, who's ready. All right, so with that in mind, we have the three nocturnes of the Office of Matins, which take us basically through the night after we pray Compline and go to bed and before we pray Lauds at, at, at dawn or when we get up. There's this idea that we should be keeping watch through the night, keeping vigil, and so Matins is referred to as the night office. And we can pray it early in the morning uh, even after it gets light. Um, some religious orders pray it at 3 a.m. Uh, many of them tend to pray it in the sort of 5.15, 5.30, 5.45 a.m. time period. So it's just sort of getting light, or in the wintertime, it's clearly very, still very dark. All right, with that in mind then, let's pray the second nocturne, which represents the second watch of the night. And we have the hymn that uh, we read through yesterday in English. And again, that would be chanted on what's called a recto tone. So today you get to hear the poetry of that in, and the cadence of that in Latin. Ira justa conditoris in brea quarum vindice, crimino sum mersi torbem noe in arca sospite, mira tandem vis amoris labi torbem sanguine. Tam salubri terra felix irrigata pluvia, ante spinas quesescatebat germinabit flosculos, inque nactaris saporem transiere absintia. Triste protinus venenum tirus sanguis posuit, 
et cruenta belluarum desi it ferocia, miti sani vulnerati hec fuit victoria. Oceensiae superne altitudo impervia, O sua vitas benigni predicanda pectoris, servus erat morte dinius rexus luit penam optimus. Quando culpis provocamus utionem iudicis, tung loquentis protegamur sanguinis presentia, ingruentium malorum tung crecerant agmina. Te redem tus laudet orbis grata servans munera, O salutis sempiterne duxet auctor inclite, qui tenes beata regna cum parentet spiritu. Amen. The second nocturne begins with the fourth antiphon. Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, delivered Jesus to them scourged. And the fifth antiphon, seeing, however, that he was doing no good, he took, took water and washed his hands in sight of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. And the sixth antiphon, and all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Psalm 63, Hear, O God, my prayer when I implore you, from the dread of the enemy rescue my soul. You have sheltered me from the conspiring of the malicious, from the throngs of evildoers. For they have wetted their tongues like swords, have bent the bow, a bitter thing, to shoot from their ambush the blameless man. They shoot him suddenly and do not fear. They encourage one another in their wicked plan. They talk of hiding snares. They have said, who shall see them? They have pried deep into evils, nor could they pry too deeply. Deep may a man's heart be, but God shall be exalted. The arrows of children shall be their plague, and their tongues shall falter and betray them. All who saw them trembled, and every man was afraid. And they proclaimed the works of God and understood his deeds. The just man shall rejoice in the Lord and hope in him. In him shall glory all the true of heart. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanses us from every sin. Sius pietas et misericordionus adivet, qui compatre spiritus sancta vivit et regnat in saecula saeculorum. Amen. Iube Domine benedicere, Deus Pater omnipotens id nobis propitius et clemens. May help come to us through the loving kindness and the mercy of him who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Pray, O Lord, of your blessing. May God the Father all-powerful be kind and lenient to us. Amen. A sermon of St. John Chrysostom from the homily to the Neophytes. Do you wish to know the power of Christ's sacred blood? Let us then review its Old Testament antecedents. Let us recall what prefigured it, listening to what sacred scripture says. Take the story of the tenth plague. The scene is Egypt, and God has foretold the death of all Egypt's for firstborn at midnight because they retained his firstborn people, but that his chosen nation would be spared, for they were living together in the same land. God devised a visible sign that would save them, a wonderful symbol, one which vividly brings home to us the power of blood. Now the divine wrath is striking the land. Now the destroyer is hurrying to every home. What does Moses do? He says, slay a yearling lamb and smear the doorposts with its blood. Such advice, O Moses, is sheep blood capable of delivering a human being? Yes, he says, not of course because it is blood, but because it foreshadows the blood of the Lord. And, but thou, O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. And we continue, pray, O Lord, a blessing. 
May Christ give us the joys of everlasting life. Amen. And St. John Chrysostom continues, For just as the statues of kings, which lack life and speech in times past, delivered men with spirit and mind to embrace them, not of course because they were cast of bronze, but because they represented the king himself. Similarly, brute blood saved the Israelites not by its own merits, but because it pointed to the advent of divine blood. And the destroyer passed by the homes whose entrances were smeared with blood and dared not enter. Likewise, the devil must now flee from the soul sealed, not with the blood of an ancient type, but with the very blood of Christ, the divine lamb. If the destroyer fled in terror from the mere figure with what unimaginable, unimaginable, unimaginable fright will Satan shrink away when he beholds the true reality? Do you desire to learn another power of this blood? I want you to look and see whence it, it, run, it first runs and from what source it flows. It comes from the cross itself. Its origin is in the Lord's side. What the soldier did was to open his side. He laid open the wall of that holy temple. What I have done is to find there a magnificent treasure. I have found, I have had the joy of discovering shining riches. But thou, O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. And we have the third nocturne, or the, the sixth lesson in the second nocturne. Pray, O Lord, a blessing. May God light the fire of his love in our hearts. Amen. And St. John Chrysostom continues. It was the same way with the lamb. What the Jews did was to kill a lamb. What I have done is to experience the fruit of the sacrament typified by the lamb. From his side flowed blood and water. Dear listener, I would not have you pass too lightly over the secrets of such a great mystery. I still have to discourse on hidden mystical matters. I have said that the water and the blood symbolized baptism and the mysteries of the altar, for it was from these that the Holy Church was founded. Through the bath of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, through baptism, I mean, and the mysteries which are seen to flow from the side of Christ. Thus, from his side did Christ build up the church, as from Adam's side, his wife, Eve, was brought forth. This is the gist of St. Paul's testimony. We are made from his body and his bones, meaning Christ's side. For just as from Adam's side God created the woman, or, for just as from Adam's side God caused the woman to be created, so also from his side did Christ give, up, give us his, the blood and water from which the church is built up. And now we have a little history. On the 1900th anniversary of the redemption of the human race, Pope Pius XI wished to celebrate a holy jubilee to honor such an unutterable benefit, and that more abundant fruit of that precious blood of the Immaculate Lamb by which we were redeemed might flow to men and its memory more vividly and more vividly be brought home to the faithful, the same Pope raised the celebration of the most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to the rank of a first-class feast to be celebrated each year by the Universal Church. So, and to, uh, but thou, O Lord, have mercy on us, thanks be to God. So we see here that as recent as 1933, this feast that had been established nearly a century before was elevated to the highest rank of feast on the 1st of July, 1933. Now, this may not be celebrated any longer in the ordinary form of the Mass, but priests can always celebrate a, uh, a votive mass of the precious blood 
any time of year for a good reason, but especially during July. July is a very good time for priests to celebrate uh, the devotion to the precious blood, which the church still acknowledges, even if the feast itself has been uh, suppressed. But those who celebrate the traditional Latin Mass, uh, called also the Usus Antiqui Or, the more antique or ancient use, also called the extraordinary form of the Roman Rite, well, we know that the 1st of July is the Solemnity of the Precious Blood. Let us continue to prepare for this great feast, and tomorrow we'll look at the third nocturne from Matins, and, uh, and we'll continue our preparation. Please subscribe to this video channel, and if you like this video, you can share it with a friend. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.